1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Love you too, dog. Puppy. Go into the chapel and we're gonna get married. Go into the chapel. Oh, that boy cracks me up. Y'all met his fiance last week. He was here, so it's kind of a really cool thing to see what God is doing in his life. Amen. Let me tell you what Christmas is all about. That's the title of my message. Let me tell you what Christmas is all about. In the next few days, I told you of a church in North Alabama, I was at, they fired the preacher because he said that, Chris, that Jesus wasn't born on December the 25th. So they fired the preacher. The deacons were upset. But the truth was, Jesus was not born on December the 25th. He was probably born somewhere around April. The bottom line for us is, though, we took a day, and we're going to celebrate a day. Amen. And we stand on that, and we thank God for the opportunity to celebrate his birth. A survey about Christmas and what do people believe about the birth of Christ in Newsweek magazine conducted it. It said 67% believe that the entire story of Christmas is, is historically accurate. The question came up, if Jesus had never been born, people believe there would be. If Jesus had never been born, think about this, what would have happened? First, that there would be less charity, less love. 61% less kindness, 59% less personal happiness, 58% less tolerance, 47% say more war, 16 said less, 26 said the same. The issue is about this, and, uh, and I think this is important. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, are you comfortable? But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Do you have a hope of heaven? Do you have a hope of eternal life? Do you have a hope of seeing your loved ones again? Do you have that hope? Well, then you've got to be able to give that answer. So it's not, it's not just laid it out for the preacher, but for you to be able. And so I have to be... Uh, uh, honest to try to teach you so that you can teach somebody else, so that you catch hold of. You don't walk out here with just a, 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 a good feeling. I want you to learn something. I've been watching, uh, I've watched World War II. I don't have regular TV now. I do have this thing called Netflix. And so I've been flipping over and I saw World War II. I was watching Prohibition. That was a joke. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, it really was. Uh, as bad as alcohol is to, toward people's lives, prohibition, it didn't work. It gave, it gave my grandmother and grandfather a job. Uh, I've, I've been, so what I've been doing is, is uh, the older I get, the more I want to know. I just want to know. I, I want to know about history. Oh, I don't want to see it repeat itself again. I, I want to pick up on things. So I, I've been watching and observing. And, and then but this thing about Christ, it, can you give an answer to the hope that is inside of you to anyone who asks. Amen. And it says, but do this with gentleness and respect. In other words, don't be arrogant. Don't be condescending. Don't be mean about what's inside of you. But with respect and gentleness, be able to tell somebody, let me tell you about Jesus. Amen. There are two things about him that unless you catch it, the, the whole gospel hinges on it. The virgin birth and the resurrection. Without these two things. So they said, well, the virgin birth really don't matter. It matters. It matters. It matters a, a great deal. Amen. Because it shows that he was the Christ to, to come. Amen. So these things matter. Father, I thank you for your word. In this the next few minutes, let our hearts be inspired to be able to share the hope in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. All of the Old Testament anticipates his arrival. He's coming. It keeps telling us that. Even in the New Testament, by the end of it, it's telling us that he is coming again. The validity of even the smallest part of the Bible tetters on the miracle of the virgin birth. Without it, without the virgin birth, Joseph was a pedophile. Mary was a promiscuous harlot. All of Christ's followers, including you and I, are imbeciles. 
in idiots. Amen. And the thousands of men who have given their lives as martyrs were absolute fools. You've got to have the, the understanding uh, of, of the virgin birth. You've got to realize that Christ came and the Holy Spirit came over a little virgin. Amen. And through that, and we've told this story over and over. The scripture says in Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. The who? The what? The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. Amen. So watch this. The word here, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Everybody look for a sign. Now a pregnant woman ain't a sign. A pregnant woman is simply a pregnant woman. But to hear the word that she was virgin, that she had never known a man, now that is a sign. The word sign is very important. It means oath. God said, I'm going to give you my oath. I'm going to give you a signal. The word is a flag. Amen. It's a beacon. A flag tells you something is there. A beacon tells you that, that you can see it in the night. It's a monument, an omen. God said, let me tell you, what you're looking for, what you're listening for, is the fact that there will be a virgin who's going to give birth to a child. God prophetically painted, portrayed, and pictured in advance the immaculate conception of Jesus for your faith to hang on to. There's a rising tide of doctrinal illiteracy among Christians and believers. I see it everywhere. Uh, when, when I think about, and I look through all types of different polls of uh, what's going on. I'm trying to get the temperature of what's happening around the world. And the Barna poll says this. Containing to, to what people believe. 26% of people believe, uh, believe all religions are basically equal. No matter what religion they got, they're all basically equal. 50% believe that good works will get you to heaven. I was raised up with this good works mentality. If you join uh, the, this lodge and this club and this good boy club and you did enough for other people, that was good enough to get you to heaven. You just stayed away. You, you didn't even have to go to church. You just had to be good enough. You had to be able to do nice things for people. And then somewhere at the end, the tally sheet would come in, and then you would make yourself an invitation into heaven. The problem with that is we got a thief on the cross who is a thief, who is a man who was involved in an insurrection of, of murdering Romans. And on the cross, he looked at Jesus and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Today. Everybody say today. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Now, that speaks volumes to me because I stood at the bed of my bootleg grandma, Jewel Dean Brewer, my middle name, Dean named after her, and she looked at me and said, God will not hear sinners. I've been told this my whole life, son, that God will not hear sinners. And I said, Grandma, if God don't hear sinners, then we and none of us got a prayer. He's got to hear us. And I said, according to the word of God that I stand on, if a thief can give his life to Jesus without doing any good works, and Granny, I know your life has been a mess. I know that you saw your son shot and killed by your own husband. I know you, you buried your daughter after she took a drug overdose, amen, and shot her own self. Your life has been miserable. It's been one thing on top of another. But I'm telling you, Granny, God can rescue you and save you today. And I prayed with her right there because I believe that if a thief on the cross can get to heaven today in paradise and didn't do any good works. Now, listen to me. Some people I know live in such a way that they believe the grace of God is going to save them and they're going to live like hell all the way to the last minute and at last second jump over on the grace. Jesus saved me. Now, I'm into Jesus saved me. I'm into that. I've been in a few near car wrecks, motorcycles down, horses throwing me, and I promise you they were not curse words on my lips. It was Jesus Help me. Amen. I, I, I need help. Now, I believe in that. And again, I like a little heads up. Give me a heads up, Jesus. On the flip side of all that, I see a God that says, listen, if my mercy is good enough to save you, it's good enough for you to live in. Amen. You can walk day to day in the grace and the wonder of God. Amen. It is a wonder. The wonder of the gospel to me is this issue of forgiveness and love that pours over us when we don't, when we want to. My pastor told me a story of a woman in New York City where during Thanksgiving holidays, a young boy threw a frozen turkey through the window of a car and smashed a woman's face. This was on the news. It broke all the bones in her face. They brought them to court. They took the young boy. He's a young 15, 16-year-old idiot just doing dumb stuff. If you didn't throw eggs, if you, listen, 
You should, I'm glad you didn't spend Halloween with me when I was a kid. Yeah, I'm just saying, that we, we just, and many of you were the same way. We don't have to share our stories, but we've we done some stuff. And this kid did something, and it caused the wreck of a woman's face. All the bones broke. They reconstructed her face. They brought her to court. When they got her into court, uh, the lawyers were there. The judge was there. Everybody against this young boy. There was such an angst and a meanness. This is a sweet lady. Her face is all busted up. And right in the middle of the court proceeding, she gets up, asks permission to hug the young boy, walks over to him, embraces him, and forgives him in the middle of the trial. The lawyers are crying. The judge is teared up, and nobody can believe what she's doing. What is this? This is the wonder of God. Amen. The fact that he came to earth and changed our lives, and she embraced him and forgave forgiveness toward him, and they released the case. This is the gospel to me. Amen. The fact that we can do that. When I look at what happens, listen, 35% do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. 45% do not believe that Satan exists. This is in the church world. 33% accept same-sex marriage. This is strong evidence of how American Christianity is conforming to the dominant secular society. Amen. It is all right to be religious according to the dictates of postmodernism, and that's the word it's used, as long as your faith exists just in your head. But if you start claiming that your beliefs are more than just a private mental state that makes you feel good, asserting instead that what you believe is objectively real and valid for everybody, to believe otherwise makes you an intolerant menace to society. Let me put that a little bit. For you to tell other people that Jesus Christ is Lord, that nobody's getting to heaven except through Jesus. Amen. You ain't got to be mean about it. Bring that back, sis. For you, for you don't have to be mean about it, but the bottom line, the world looks at you as intolerant and that you are a menace to society. That everything you, that's why they get mad at you when you post stuff on certain things on social media and they want to take it off because look at you, you're intolerant. Whatever this generation chooses to tolerate, the next generation will practice in excess. Whatever this generation chooses to tolerate, the next generation will practice in excess. They'll just double down on it. They'll go after it even more. Christmas in, the, in the, this worldview, maybe Jesus, maybe don't need to defend him, but maybe he does. Maybe in 2019 we need to stand up and say, you know what, let me defend who he is. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. You know, we aren't straining things to say. Everything is different now that Christ is coming to the world. The coming of Christ establishes the truth of all that we believe. Now, in this day of social media and all the things that, that go on, imagine if you would, and I've seen it, babies being born. There are babies being born in our church and connected with people in our church. Oh, man, when them babies are born, they get 60 or 70 likes. They, they get about 40 or 50 comments on there and congrats. And now a lot of these congrats blow up with little balloons all over the place. Can you imagine if Jesus was born during the time of social media? Amen. If somebody said, believe it or not, there's a young girl named Mary who was a virgin. She had a husband named Joseph. Amen. And they were in a little town like in Bethlehem. And you friends with her on social media? And next thing you see, a baby wrapped up, and, and, and the angels show up to a bunch of guys out digging on a pipeline, and they drop their shovels and their picks, and they take off running to the local hospital to see this thing that has happened. When they get there, this baby, it would, be, it, it would blow up. And yet, without social media, God took an obscure town and little couple, and he promoted them with the anthems of angels. He said, I don't need social media. I can use my own troop. Angels, get down there. Amen. And they went down, and things began to happen. Listen, it's the claims of being, of relating to Christmas. An angel visited a virgin who became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The baby in her womb was the son of God from heaven. God caused a heathen emperor to call for taxation that sent Mary and Joseph back to Bethlehem at the very moment Jesus was born. Prophets foretold both the virgin birth and his birth in Bethlehem hundreds of years before it happened. A star led, listen, hundreds of years before it happened, the word came, a virgin going to have a child, a little town. Amen. All these things begin to happen. Listen, Joseph uh, prophets foretold. A, a star led the Magi, the wise men, preached on that last week, from the east directly to the house in where Jesus was. Angels spoke to shepherds. 
An angel spoke to Joseph on three separate occasions. Every time Joseph went to sleep, an angel showed up in his dreams. I'm telling you, some of these dreams that God will give you, you need to pay attention to them. Amen. I try to write things down or have my phone near where I can post something. If I get a dream, if, if God shows me something about somebody, if you in my dreams, I'm probably going to call you up. I'm going to check on you. Because why in the world would you be messing in my dreams? So I'm going to call folk up. I'm going to talk to them. I, but the angel showed up every time. to warn Joseph, don't, don't go, now go. Green light, red light, yellow light. Amen. Helping Joseph through life. Angels spoke to shepherds. Amen. Even the slaughter of the infant boys of Bethlehem were fulfilled by ancient prophecy. When A. Simeon held baby Jesus in his arms, he prophesied of his death on the cross. He told Mary, this boy is going to cause a falling and a rise into many in Israel, and he's going to put a dagger into your heart. Mama, there's one thing. You want everybody to say how pretty old baby is? Now, I have been... Misaligned by my comments that not all babies are cute. They not. Some of them, when they come out, they ugly. Old pony head, red skin, just messed up. Y'all post them on and go, isn't my grandbaby pretty? And I just go, ooh, bless their heart. I mean, I've got five kids. They all didn't turn out so pretty when they were born. But as I got older, it, you know, things popped in and got all right. Some of them are better looking now than they were when they were little. Some of them are uglier now than when they were little. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. <laughs> Simeon held that little baby and said, he, he's going to cause your heart to break, Mama. This was what happened. Then there are the names he was given. Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Jesus, Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, Son of the Most High, Christ the Lord. Look back what Isaiah said again. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. These were the names he would be given. This is why I call it a glorious mix-up. This is why you can't argue theology with every church you meet. Amen. That Jesus is God. The scripture lays it out, and yet he's the son of God. It is glorious to me on how it mixes up, but I don't fight over it. I just accept it the way it is. He is the everlasting father, the prince of peace. This week, I pray for peace. Then there are the things he will accomplish. He will save his people from their sins. He will reign from David's throne in Jerusalem. His kingdom will never end. He didn't come to usurp authority. He didn't come down to be a, a ty tyrannical king. When he came to earth, he wrapped himself in flesh. Amen. He grew up. He became wise. He became strong. I believe he, was, he learned a trade from his father, Joseph. When Joseph dies, there is no obituary. I will call friends at times, Truman, and ask them questions. I didn't see you in the obituary. I'm checking on you. But when Joseph died, there was no biblical obituary. There wasn't much on Moses when he died, except God said he's dead. In other words, when God, it's just, it, God just looks at it like it's transition. Amen. It's over and out. You're, you're here, it's over here, and you get out there. It, it, that's the way it is. But, but his kingdom will never end. His kingdom started then. It's still going on. We're all about the kingdom of God. When, when Jesus came preaching... He didn't say a whole lot about heaven like we many of us think. He talked about the kingdom of God. That's why I'm always looking at the things of the kingdom, the language of the kingdom, the ambassadors from the kingdom, everything that goes on in the kingdom. When the kingdom comes, you, you know when a kingdom takes over another kingdom, they take their books and destroy all of their books and all of their history and give them a new future? When God came into my life, he took away all the old books, all my, all my past, everything in the file cabinet. He burned all of that. He said, now you're an ambassador from my kingdom. Now get out there and tell people about me. That's what the king did. Luke chapter 2. We'll start closing with this. Luke 2 verse 8. Last week, you don't know the joy I had sitting on this platform with those kids around me. There are times in a pastor's life at preaching in mega churches, being on radio and TV, is all real small to me 
compared to getting to sit right here on this platform and read to your children. Luke chapter 2. I looked into their eyes. They were captivated by Luke chapter 2. The Bible still works today as it did thousands of years ago. The story is still relevant today. It just does something. And I, I mean, I, I walked out of here on cloud nine because I got to read to your children. That meant the most. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. They were keeping watch over the flocks at night. Shepherds were considered the lowest of the low. There was blue collar and then there was no collar. They was the lowest of the low. This this issue of coming to the shepherds speaks to me of the common man and woman. That God didn't build this thing up as a triumphant entry into a palace. But they're looking over their flocks at night. Their lives were 7, 24. If you know anything about farmers, cows can't feed themselves. Horses can't feed themselves. You've got to be at it 24-7. If you're dealing with milk cows, you've got to milk them in the morning and milk them in the evening. you got to stay on it. You don't get a break. These shepherds weren't invited into the tabernacle. They weren't invited into the temples. They weren't invited into the palace. And yet heaven decided to show up to them. They were watching. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. There'd be nothing like sitting beside a fire. Enjoying the heat from the fire, and all of a sudden, everything just got bright around you. If I'm in a dark room, and I see somebody fixing and turn the lights on, I close my eyes. Because I know what's fixing to happen is going to disturb me. And then I barely open my eyes, I let them adjust back to the light. Those shepherds in my mind's eye, I see them around the fire, and then the angel of the Lord shows up. And when the angel of the Lord gets there, he looks at them, and he yells at them, uh, as a matter of fact, the Bible said they were terrified. If you are man's man, you take care of the sheep, your hands are calloused, you're dealing with wolves, you're dealing with bears, ain't nothing scares you. You sitting in that deer blind, I don't care what comes out sitting with your wife, you ain't scared. Amen, you are you tough, you're able to handle it. I, there, there had to be something. And then the angel showed up, and they were afraid. And the angel said, don't be afraid. Don't tell me not to be afraid. I, you just blew my mind. You just showed up from heaven. You just exploded everything around here. It's all bright. There's glory everywhere. He said, I bring you some good news, some great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You're going to find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, now watch this carefully now. One angel got there ahead of the other angels. I don't know how that was. Did he just fly faster? Was he sent first? Did you see it? One angel gets there with a proclamation. One angel gets there and tells him today in the town of David, a Savior's been born. One is going to save you from your sins. One angel gets there like that. Then suddenly, everybody say suddenly. So now I've already had this terrified experience. I've had the light shining. I've had the glory all over the place. i got one angel yelling in my ear that, that God has a, a Savior being born in another town. Then suddenly, in other words, on top of already all that, y'all show up and scared me more. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly It don't say three, four, ten, fifty, hundred appeared with the angel praising God saying praising God praising God what were they praising God for that they got to leave that realm the kingdom and come to this realm you don't think the angels had been waiting for centuries upon thousands of years knowing the plan of the Father, that the Father had started something in Genesis chapter 3, that the seed of the, of the woman was going to crush the, the head of the serpent. You don't think the angels knew a little bit about what's going on?
when they came and they quoted the word of God saying that he is here, the Savior has come, amen, the heat, they know all about it. And when they got to earth, you don't see, you don't know if they, their feet touched, if they hovered. I know in your mind, I know what you think. You've got that superhero thing. They're hovering over the angels. Or are they standing with them? Or did they sit down with them? But the bottom line is when they got there, they praised God. Let me tell you about the Father. When I hear somebody praising God, it, the, the word praise God is, is, is a, a, the phrase we use for the accolades that people are using. The Bible don't tell us what they're saying. It just said they praise God. But I can imagine them saying, the great Father has sent us majesty. Uh, they, they begin to use words that... that the human ear has never heard before. They begin to explain the splendor and the glory of the one that just left, that, that sent them there. The one that got there first backed up and sent him with them as they began to praise God. Amen. And they then said, as they begin to do that, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The angel announced so beautifully, I bring you good tidings of great joy. The word great in the Greek is the word mega. I know you're familiar with it because that's what you do when you order your food. Mega size it. Make it bigger. Magnify it in fries. Mm -hmm. Give me the big drink. I want the 45 ounce. Mm -hmm. Mega. It's going to be mega joy. That's what he's saying here. Great, mega, mega joy to all people. No one is omitted. Then the Lord makes it close and personal. For there is born to you this day, this day a Savior to you. In the middle of whatever is your pain, your difficulty, your anger, your frustration, sin, or failure. To you today, a Savior. You may not see the promise fulfilled, but you see the promise present. And the call is to rejoice. To get excited. There at the foot of the cross, we come and receive the ultimate gift of eternal life through Christ the Son. It is from that cross there shines the light of the world a full hope in salvation. Stand with me if you would. Mega joy. My hope and prayer for you this Christmas is for mega joy. That joy would just be, and, and please, 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 it's not in that gift under the tree. It's not worth it. It's in giving that gift that's under the tree. It's celebrating the birth of him who saved us. I have this hope that when I'm dead and gone, that the gospel we've preached in this house lives on. And that people pick up the baton and they have a hope. I've mentioned to you, I watched World War II. I'm watching Vietnam also. I'm, I just study war. But I look at the passing of people in their lives. Tragedies that people have gone through. I say, God, this nation needs more joy. Joy to the world. This world needs more joy. Let it start with the people of this house. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, you've put a gift. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. You've packaged this gift in these earthen vessels so that we may shine them and show them to the world. Make us heralds of this gospel. Make us people that can explain our hope that it was a virgin birth. And yes, Jesus resurrected. And yes, I believe it by faith. Just like I'm breathing air that I don't see. I know and I know and I know what Jesus did for me. God, I thank you for this house. I pray blessing on them for this holiday and those watching online. That this would be the greatest Christmas you've ever experienced. That there'd be great joy in your life. And, and here's the thing. Quit looking at yourself so much. Look toward others. And enjoy the joy they're having. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come give God a praise. Woo! 2019 is almost over.
over. 